this on? Can you hear me? Should we get started? I know there wasn't much of a break there with with Jurgen going over, but uh, to uh, try and keep with the schedule, I I think we should uh, we should get get moving. Um, it'll be hard to follow Jurgen, uh, so hopefully I'll. Uh, do some good, and you can get some uh, good information about uh, Spring Cloud and, and uh, some of the different discovery and configuration systems uh, that exist. So I've been on the Spring Cloud team for a few years with Dave Sire, and the team has grown recently. And uh, I've had a lot of fun doing it. So I hope we can. Have a good time for the few minutes that I'm up here today. Uh, first, a little bit about the roadmap. We just released uh, Camden, which is the, the latest release train for Spring Cloud. Major feature there is a new project called Spring Cloud Contract. It is a consumer-driven contracts framework that allows you to guarantee that the API contracts that, that you have don't break your internal clients or your external clients if you provided the, the contracts to them. Very useful in, in continuous delivery types of situations. We also had a service release for Brixton, which is largely a bug fix release. Our next release train will be Dalston. These are London tube station names. Our Dave Sire, who lives in, uh, actually lives in Brixton. So we're trying to follow the Spring Boot release cycles. So Camden followed on the heels of uh, Spring Boot 1.4, and Dalston will follow on the heels of Spring Boot 1.5. For example, one of the features that we're looking at adding that uh, you'll see a little bit of a demo today later is adding support for Vault configuration directly in Spring Boot applications. Camden added a release that added, I will, we'll talk about that later, how's that? After Dalston, the e-release, which will follow Spring 5 and Spring Boot 2. Uh, sometime in the beginning of, of next year. So we'll, we'll move to that same Java 8 baseline. We'll also try and get as many service releases in as we can with bug fixes and small enhancements uh, as we move along. So who here has heard of microservices? <laughs> okay, bad question. Who here is doing microservices at work? Or w okay, some. Now, who wants to move to microservices who are not? Okay, a few of you. Well, let me just show the picture to explain the sentiment. There's a lot that moving to microservices buys you. Uh, in your organization, for one, allowing teams to independently deploy. There are technical advantages in that you're not stuck to any particular stack, right? Your individual projects could change and migrate. There are other benefits as well, but with those benefits come problems, right? And Spring Cloud was created in an effort to reduce developer pain in dealing with those problems and reduce the boilerplate that if you you know look at what Netflix did or what some other company did and you see them solving similar problems in different ways we hope to reduce that pain so you don't have to reinvent the microservice wheel uh, for lack of a better term so a couple of those things that we'll talk about today are in particular discovery uh, systems and configuration systems and how those can benefit your application, what are the differences between them. So 
So one question I get quite often is, which, which discovery system should I use? And, and my answer is always, it depends. And so this talk hopefully will clarify what some of those reasons are and why you might pick one over uh, another. So starting with service registration discovery, in principle, it's a fairly simple idea, right? There's this registry that lives somewhere, and its job when a service comes up is to service says, hey, I'm here, and it's just a phone book, right? So this is, it has a registry of all the locations of service A. And so when service B says, I want to talk to service A, it says to the registry, hey, can I have a service A? You know, can you point me to one? So in principle, it's fairly simple. And in, in practice, there are lots of, lots of details that, uh, that can affect how your system responds in, you know, when an instance of service A disappears, for example, or, you know, how do you deal with, and I've got Will over here, how do you deal with putting out a new version of service A, right? How does that work? So the primary vehicle in Spring Cloud for dealing with service registration and discovery is this annotation, right? This is our, for every problem in Spring, uh, how do you solve it? With, with an annotation, right? So, so we did. Enable discovery client. And it's, it's an interesting name because not only does it give you access to the registry, it also performs auto registration of your service to that registry. So it performs two things, um, and we're going to take care of some of those semantic issues in Dalston, hopefully, that will make it a little more clear what, what's happening when you do this. So right now, when you put this on your, your class, will register with the discovery service and give you access to the, to the registry. So you can programmatically access an instance from the, the registry by using the discovery client and asking for service A, and it will give you a service instance, which is basically a host and a port, and you can do whatever you want with it. Most of the time, you probably don't want to do that. You're just like the most basic use case is making a, a rest call. So if you declare a rest template with the, I should have put that on this, this slide now that I'm saying it, annotated with at load balanced, then we will enhance that rest template to make it aware of the discovery service. And when you use, when you reference a service you want to call. Instead of having a host name and port, you just put in the service name. We also instrument uh, Fane so that it can be used with, with Discovery. Has everyone, anyone heard of Fane before? A few of you that, um, it's a declarative REST client. So rather than REST template, which is an imperative style, uh, you annotate an interface and we create an implementation for you. Anyway, it's a pretty slick little uh, tool. So distributed configuration in principle is even simpler than, than service registration. So I have, let me back up. Who's familiar with the 12-factor applications? Okay, some of you. If, for those of you who are not, I would recommend visiting 12factor.net and reading the 12 factors. So this was uh, created by Heroku, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, as they built their platform and, and thought about how applications should behave. And one of the principles is that configuration should be external to the application. Um, the, the, the particular principle says it should be should come from the environment. And uh, we'll get into a little bit of that, how that works in a Spring application. So there's a config server, again, living somewhere. 
And when applications come up, they say, hey, I'm an A or a B. Will you hand me my configuration? And the way it works in, in, uh, in Spring is that we add a place in the life cycle of the application that allows it to make the remote call to the config server and bring back the configuration so that then as the application continues to start up, it will have that information. So we call that the bootstrap application context. So it goes out to the config server, puts that into Spring's environment abstraction, and then continues on with the normal startup of an application. So how do you interact with Spring's environment? Uh, does anyone see the STS demo at lunch? There was a bunch of people here. He showed this, right, at configuration properties. If you have an at configuration properties bean in your application, it will load from config server if there are properties defined for that particular namespace. This would be the recommended approach from, from our side to use Spring Boot's configuration properties uh, annotation to access those. There are other ways to do it. Uh, at value is a Spring framework annotation. There's also the environment interface that you could inject or use the environment aware uh, interface from Spring as well. You could ask for individual properties that way. So here's a, a quiz question. Does anyone know difference between configuration properties and at value. Okay, we're going to get someone from a teacher's pet here. Okay, Will. Right. So if you couldn't hear, the one of the big differences between at value, and I know they're, they're dealing with this on their team uh, right this minute, <laughs> um, at value, uh, does not support the Spring Boot relaxed uh, binding properties. So in Spring Boot, you could declare um, all caps environment variable with underscores, and it would get mapped to dots, right? Or the camel case to dashes, that kind of thing uh, is not handled with uh, at value. And so configuration properties gives you that advantage. So we created a config server, which is a greenfield project. It has an HTTP API similar to uh, the Netflix config server. Anyone heard of that one? No, they haven't. They never, this is one of the things that they did not open source. But when we met with them, we talked about it, what was their API. And so we tried to model something similar. It's backed by an environment repository abstraction. It used to say, I'm t I just changed this bullet a few minutes ago, so I was reading through it. it. used to say it was backed by a version control system. Well, that changed in Camden. So it's not just version control systems that back it. So Git and Subversion are version control systems, and you can store your configuration in those, but you can also store your configuration in Vault. Anyone heard of uh, Vault before? For those of you who have not, it's a product by HashiCorp, which uh, they are the guys that uh, made Vagrant and Console. Um, Vault is a tool to manage secrets. That's its job, and, and it, lots of uh, companies are migrating that way. And so this allows you to deploy Vault but then your clients don't have to be, when I say clients, the configuration clients, your applications don't have to know how to speak to Vault. They can just know how to speak to config server, and it will handle that communication with, with Vault. It's stateless, so you can bring up a cluster of config servers, put them behind a load balancer, and it doesn't matter which, which one stores your, which receives your um, requests. One of the things that we've, we've added in Spring Cloud is the refresh scope. If you want your bean 
this is one of those things that I'll take my cues from, from Jurgen as he was talking about the things you can do with, uh, with annotations. For the most part, every example I've seen of refresh scope is usually has a class and it has that value and you want to update that value. And so you mark your bean with that refresh scope and then when the application is refreshed, you get the new value. If you're using configuration properties, you don't need to do that. Configuration properties by default are refreshed um, during the refresh scope. You can also serve plain text files from config server. For example, you could serve up uh, localization files we've had uh, or requests for other types of files like key stores. They can also serve up binary files as well. We tried to keep it modeling the Spring Boot uh, configuration files and semantics. So when you're using version control, you're literally using properties or YAML files. In uh, Vault, we try to mimic that uh, with the keys that are in Vault. We have an auto-configured client for you, just including a starter. And you can refresh via the Spring Cloud bus, which you can send a message using a uh, message broker, and all your instances will react to that refresh notice and reload their configuration. One thing that has been asked for is, I want to push my configuration changes. Well, Git and Subversion don't really fit that model very well, and so we added support where you can configure webhooks in systems like GitHub or GitLab, and those will poke configuration server and then send out a message again via the bus to uh, refresh. But this happens on a push or a pull request change or something like that. And we have commercial support uh, for config server in, in Pivotal Cloud Foundry. All right, let's see if we can show you. No, that's not what I wanted to happen. There we are. So normally this is the point where I would uh, do my best Josh Long impressions and tell you about start.spring.io, how if you're sad or lonely, start.spring.io, and we would go build a configuration server app, right? Well, I don't want to do that. I'm not sad. I'm not uh, tired. We have a short demo, so I'm going to do something new. You all see that down at the bottom? It's getting bigger as I... <laughs> now it's going to be too big. Awesome. So new feature in Camden is the Spring Cloud uh, CLI command. So I'm going to push one button, and uh, hopefully we'll get a uh, config server up and running. So there we see it's, it's deployed. So let's go to our browser. So Got a simple REST um, interface. So here you can see I went to localhost. Foo would be my application name. Default would be the profile that I'm sending it. So we're asking for the Foo application, and we get back some properties. that come from, you'll see two files. One is application.yaml. So in config server, if your application, files named application are applicable to every app that asks for configuration, and with the application name are more specific. Okay, so in the app, what you would see for foo is foo from props, not from default. Um, 
You can ask for text files like I showed you before. So here I'm asking for a text resource as opposed to the properties file. Also, we support what if you're, you have some applications that aren't Java. They don't have the auto-configured client. Well, you can ask for configuration in the uh, uh, some other endpoints we have. You could request them in JSON, so your Node.js app could get it. Uh, you could ask for it in just plain YAML for your Python apps or Go apps or whatever. So there are other mechanisms for other application languages to get their configuration. Okay. When am I done? How much time do I have? When's it to? Okay. 3.25? Okay. Sweet. So those are some of the things that you can do with, with Config Server. Um, I think I'll move on to move on with the demo. So moving on to discovery system that we went with to start was, was Eureka from Netflix. This was something that had been battle tested. Eureka has been running at Netflix for a very long time with very high loads and lots of applications under them. So some of the pros from Eureka, it's highly available. They run in a peer configured cluster. Now that cluster is not a dynamic cluster. So every node in the cluster needs to be statically configured to know about the other nodes. But it, it can be run in a cluster. Battle hardened by Netflix. It has tight integration with Ribbon, which is the Java client side load balancer that they have. So Ribbon can get its list of servers from Eureka automatically. Uh, Will and his team have provided support uh, in Pivotal Cloud Foundry with the Spring Cloud Services tile, which Will will be given a talk at what time? So downstairs, uh, right after this, if you want to hear more about Eureka and Config Server in Pivotal Cloud Foundry, go to Will's talk in Union. Is that what I heard? Okay. So there's my plug there. So some of the cons that come with Eureka, uh, it's JVM based. The thick giant cl Java client is the easiest way to register. And in the early days, the code was awful and messy, and we did, you know, bad things. And I had to, I don't know, it was not fun working with their code initially. It's gotten much, much better, though. We, have, we meet with the Netflix engineers. We have a, a, a means of communicating with them, and they're very responsive to pull requests and to bug reports. So they're, they're an awesome group to work with. If you want to do Polyglot, right, so you have Node.js, then Sidecar, running a Sidecar is a, is a way to do that. Basically, it's a Java application that sits next to yours, and it does the communication with, with Eureka for you. It was initially built for AWS. So there are some AWS-isms in Eureka, and sometimes, you know, how do you translate those to uh, if you're running on PCI, for example? There can be some interesting caching issues. So Netflix, you know, they may have hundreds of a particular service running, so waiting a minute and a half before that new instance shows up in the large, in the long run, doesn't make a big difference. But if you're running a small number of instances, sometimes that, uh, that can cause issues. So I want to show a, just a really short demo to, to what your whistle 
of Eureka. So now, not only am I going to run config server, this terminal is, I'm also going to run Eureka. And I'll show you why I'm having config server run as well, because it's a client of Eureka and was created with that. So there's a little message here that I need to go to this page to see the dashboard. Here we are. And you'll see there's nothing registered yet, right? But I told you the config server was a client. Well, this is some of these timeout, these waiting periods um, that we need to go, and their config server is registered. So config server just had at enabled discovery client on it, and it automatically registered with, with Eureka. So the next thing I want to talk about is console. Console is a, a same makers of, of Vault that uh, console is an interesting tool in that it has more than one hat. Eureka is single purpose. It stores registration data in memory and, and systems can register themselves and get it registration information of other services. Well, console can do m more than one thing. It can do service registration and discovery. Service discovery is a top level concern in console. It has support for registration, uh, has support for health checks, um, but it also is a key value store, so you can put your configuration into, into console. By default, console's interface is HTTP based. So any language can get their configuration from console. Any language can register with console. So one of the pros in evaluating whether or not you want to use one of these, this may be a, a, a good reason. But it also has a legacy DNS server that it runs so that those legacy services that you can't change, right? Whether it's a vendor application or it's so old that you, you, you can't update it to do some of these new things. Well, those generally support DNS, and so you could plug console into your uh, local DNS system, and it will resolve names from there. It also has security built in by default with lots of different ways to segment and, and control who can see what, from registrations to keys and key value to who can see events and who can see and change uh, security as well. And it supports uh, health checks. So by default in Eureka, the only way it knows if a service is up is if that service is regularly sending a heartbeat. So it's up to the service to let Eureka know that I'm up. Well, console's a little more proactive, and it can actually go touch your service in any way that you define. By default in Spring Cloud, we set up an HTTP health check, which is going to go to the Spring Boot uh, health endpoint and see if it gets a successful response from that. But anything that you can script in shell, you could configure as a health check. Console has a, a multi-data center uh, aware built into it, so it's, it's built to be able to uh, run in multiple data centers, and that support is getting better as more and more things sync automatically across data centers. There's integration with Vault. Um, Vault console can be the key value store that is backing Vault. We built it so that the same contents of YAML and properties files that you see in Spring Boot, you can throw right in a key and those get served up from console. It uses a peer-to-peer -peer gossip system where with Eureka, 
the cluster has to know, be statically configured. With console, your local agent just needs to know one server, and then it will be communicated the whole cluster to your local agent via the peer-to-peer -peer gossip system. That's a pretty nice little UI that I'll show you. Some of the concerns with console is it's very young. It just released uh, 0 0.7 a week or two ago. You have to run an agent on every host, so that may be difficult for, for your particular environment. It's small. Console's written in Go, but uh, you still have to start that sidecar on everything that, that you want to run. I want to show you a little bit. Console. Maybe one of the reasons my terminal is running slow is because I previously started console here. And also, I started uh, Vault underneath. So Vault has a uh, nice little command line tool. I can show you what, uh, what I use to write my secrets into uh, console, or to Vault, excuse me. So here you can see that I, I wrote at b.secret as into to vault. So just pretty simple what I'm, what I'm doing. But I want to show you what, uh, how the ACLs in not only console but vault work. So I'm going to run a couple of uh, different applications here. In fact, if you want to see, so I haven't showed you a lot of code. It's one of the reasons I haven't shown you a lot of code is because some of the code demos aren't aren't really that interesting, right? So the, here's my at enable discovery client, right? That's, that's the one line. So it's, it's, it's not super interesting. But let me bring up the uh, console UI. So you can see I have two different applications uh, registered and one instance of each running. So if I go to port 9900, show you its environment. Anyone familiar with Boot's actuator? Right, these are endpoints that are, give you some nice production quality uh, mechanisms to help with your applications. This is the environment endpoint. And you can see that there is a property source that is a vault property source. Uh, for app A, and it has its secret, and it's not hiding it here. If I, my one little endpoint just prints that secret and the shared secret, so I have my secret is from app A. I show you port 99.1. You'll see it's app B secret. Now, what if I'm some other application? I want to see app B's secrets. So I'm just going to change my name, because that's what we key off of, the Spring application name. I'm just going to change the name and run and see if I can get app B's uh, configuration. So I'll show you my, so I just went and changed my name to, to app A. I'm just going to pretend that I'm app A. See, as we start up, you'll see a, an exception fly by there. And that was with, with good reason, because if I now go to my fake app A's environment, you can see that it was empty. I didn't return to the client that now it was denied, because you don't have the right credentials. It's, then they would know that they, 
they were wrong. But uh, on the server side, it certainly logged that there was a problem uh, getting, they did not have access to AppA's uh, configuration. So very nice for security and uh, segmenting who can see what. So back to, to the presentation, uh, another thing I want to mention is Zookeeper. Um, Zookeeper is a consistent key value store. It's used in lots of different systems to manage the state of a cluster or something like that. Started life managing the state of a Hadoop cluster to begin with. It's been around for a long time. Lots of companies use it. Um, it's pretty useful if you already use Zookeeper, right? Why, why introduce something new if you've got something that can do the job? It's nice because when you, you can create ephemeral nodes in Zookeeper. So you make a connection to Zookeeper. As long as you maintain that connection, uh, Zookeeper can make some assumptions that you're, the node that made that connection is still up. And that's how the curator service discovery recipe tells whether applications are up or not, is if they maintain that uh, ephemeral node and that connection to Zookeeper. So uh, to be fair, I have not run Zookeeper in production. So these are things I have read about and not necessarily experienced firsthand. And some of these issues may have been taken care of and may, may have gotten better. But Zookeeper can have scale issues, right? Once you get to a certain number of nodes and connections to those Zookeeper nodes, there can be trouble. Uh, I have heard that there are operations headaches with Zookeeper, and you need something managing the life cycle of, of a Zookeeper like the Netflix exhib exhibitor sidecar. And those persistent connections are good, but then they're persistent connections. So you have to have the, the network, network infrastructure to maintain persistent connections for every node that you have up and running, which might or might not be a problem. So I'm not going to show you a demo of Zookeeper, but uh, it operates in much the same way that Config Server and Eureka and Console do. Uh, just a simple annotation, you just change which uh, starter that you use. So honorable mention, who's ever used Apache as a discovery, service discovery, right? Probably more of you than, than realize it, right? It's an effective load balancer, right? For certain classes of applications, that may be good enough or Nginx, or something like HA proxy. Those work, right? It's an extra network hop. If you don't care, this may be, this may be a way to go. Uh, we have a project that actually Josh Long created initially, Spring Cloud Cloud Foundry. When you're in a platform, that platform knows about every instance that was registered with it. Do you necessarily need another discovery system, right? These are good questions uh, to ask. We could do the same with etcd. Um, Airbnb has an interesting uh, service discovery uh, stack. Runs, um, I believe it runs HA proxy on every node. And when you want to make a connection out, not just you know, HTTP connections, but binary connections to a database even it runs through HA proxy, which that external thing is what's connected to the, to the discovery system. Um, Uber's Hyperbon is another interesting uh, uh, tool that is, it's a fun video if you ever want to, to go watch it in very different style of service discovery than all of these systems that I have mentioned <laughs> here previously. Um, pretty much to the end of my presentation, if there are questions from, from
from you guys. I'd love to. We've got the time, so we can uh, go ahead and ask away. We have our volatile uh, projectile microphone. <laughs> Just we ask, I'm asking that you know, considering all these different choices, if somebody has to choose only one, what will you recommend? <laughs> yes, so see, this was the question that I, that I said I get asked all the time. And you have to take into consideration all of those pros and cons from each one and decide you know, which one suits your situation the best. You know, Eureka lives in the highly available spectrum of the CAP theorem. Who's familiar with the CAP theorem from database and then yeah, cluster theory, right? That you can, you can be, you can choose two of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Well, um, Eureka chooses availability and partition tolerance, right? If there's a, a mode in Eureka called self-preservation mode, that if a certain number of registrations stop responding with heartbeats, it assumes that there's a network problem and some partition has happened and it stops removing nodes from the registry because they haven't received a heartbeat. So it will serve you stale data rather than serve you no data. Um, console, on the other hand, lives in the consistent uh, realm. Well, it, it will serve you, uh, you know, as soon as a registration comes in, it's immediately available for, for systems to see. And there isn't the, the lag time like there is in Eureka. If security is important to you, you may choose console over Eureka. Uh, that's one of the value adds to, to Spring Cloud services that we add to Eureka. They've taken the time to engineer an access control list on top of Eureka, which is not available uh, in open source. Um, you know, what languages are you running in your system? If it's all Java, well, maybe Eureka. If, if you have Java and Node.js and Go, well, maybe you choose something that integrates with those other languages easily as well, right? If you, you know, if I asked you what database should I use for my application, what would you tell me? Sure. Right, right. So for different situations, you have different databases, right? So anyway, great question, though. When I get quite often. Anybody else? Yeah, asking if if config server is just a key value store. Um, in fact, it it does not do any sort of uh, persistence in and of itself. It relies on some third party library to read the data, right? So uses a Git library to read data from a Git repository, and then it sends that data on to the configuration clients. Or it makes a, a API request to Vault. So it, it doesn't store any data at all. Just simple HTTP API with a few parameters. So here. There's a. When you're doing config server, when you're using config server, is there a way to override stuff on your local environment if you're just during development want to change some value or something like that? So what's really nice is that it plugs into the Spring environment abstraction, right? So if I come back to, to here, we're, we're not pointed at config server here, but vault and, and console, but we have system properties, we have environment variables. We have the local uh, configuration files. And then 
too. Sorry. Why does it say it's in Swedish? That's funny. Um, you also have command line arguments. And with config server, actually, if there's not a config server running, by default, config client says, oh, OK, and just ignores the fact that it's not running. And we'll use just local configuration. So that's, that's really nice. Um, in production, you might want to configure that differently so that if config client, config server isn't available, fail, right, or retry four or five minutes and then stop. But uh, local development, you don't even have to have it running. Okay. Are there questions? So, if say you're running an application instance in the cloud in production and it wants to connect and get some vault secrets, how does the application identify itself to vault and how would you manage those? I guess they're kind of like meta secrets. Right. So, right now, um, we have a uh, token that you add to configuration. You know, best way to do that currently would be in like as an environment variable, right? So it's not checked in anywhere. Um, there are multiple ways of identifying yourself in Vault, and uh, as part of Dalston, um, there will be more method, more of the supported methods for connecting to Vault and configuring yourself. You know, here's me, here's who I am. Um, so those are more types of uh, authentication are coming. So anybody else? If not, thanks for listening. Hope you uh, enjoyed it. <laughs>